remind you of anyone, a friend, a political acquaintance, an actor you've worked with, a character? <laughs> no, he's a, he's a, he is himself and uh, no imitation of anyone that I've ever known, but uh, I must say this, he is, uh, I have found him quite different from other leaders of his country that I had known before and spoken to before. How does he compare with other world leaders that you've uh, encountered? Is, how would you rank him as a negotiator? Well, he is, uh, he is that. And, uh, he's a consummate negotiator, uh, would you say? Well, he's, he's um, uh, I would think he, he has the stature that goes with his, his position. And uh, I think maybe Margaret Thatcher uh, uh, described it best of all when she was the one who met him before I had and uh, was probably one of the first of the Western leaders to meet him. And she said, uh, this is someone you can do business with. Is there some, what is it in his style as a negotiator? Is he cunning? Is he aloof? Is he a sort of fellow you really have to knock heads with? Oh no, he uh, well he doesn't doesn't hold back. But uh, uh, no, you don't get any feeling of uh, cunning or anything. He's uh, he's straightforward. Straightforward, yes. What advice would you give President Dukakis or President Bush in dealing with Gorbachev? Well, I hope that I would only have to give the advice to President Bush. Uh, and uh, what sort of uh, advice would you give? How to deal with the man? Oh, I think I would you know, just relate. Well, I already uh, he knows a great deal of, about our meetings because I've related yeah. to him and uh, uh, the things that we've done, and and he's had his opportunity to meet him also, mm -hmm. so he's met him and knows him, and uh, uh, I think it would just be more an expressing of my hope that uh, he would carry forward with what has been started mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what I think is, uh, has set us on a pretty good course. Could Dukakis stand up to Gorbachev? Well, I don't know Dukakis uh, that well. Uh, but I just, uh, uh, I'm quite critical of uh, some of the things that he proposes as uh, answers to problems that he thinks he sees. Uh, and uh, I don't think some of the problems exist. Mm -hmm. So I just don't know. Um, well, let's go back to you. The, what was the most frank and heated exchange of this summit? Chief of Staff Baker noted that at your very first meeting with Gorbachev, the two of you struck sparks. What was that about? Well, I'm not sure in the very first meeting that we struck sparks, uh, I, unless he means that uh, we established a relationship and got along. It was, his, was his impression was it was his what he said to the press was sort of a more, a more uh, confrontational uh, heated exchange that you had. What was the most heated exchange of the summit that the two of you had? I think it was when we really got into the subject of uh, of uh, human rights. Mm -hmm. What did he say? And so to forth. You? Well, uh, after all, he's been raised in that society. He he t uh, tends to believe the things that he's been told about us as he has grown up and over the years. And I think he sincerely and honestly uh, uh, thought that we were attempting to tell them how to run their business. Mm -hmm. And uh, he pointed out things that he thought were wrong here. And they were. What, what, did, he, what well, did he say to you? The type of things that uh, uh, would be in their propaganda that uh, uh, homeless people and uh, uh, we hadn't taken uh, care of our racial problems mm -hmm. and so forth. That sort of thing. What was your response when he talked well, about the racial problem? Well, our, my response was to be as frank as I could with him and tell him uh, what our problems had been, what we've, the actions that have been taken to uh, uh, eliminate uh, uh, some of the things that he spoke of, mm -hmm. and uh, to, to give him uh, as much information as I could about our, mm -hmm. our society. And also, at the same time then, to uh, make him see that I wasn't really trying to run his country for him. I was trying to point out mm -hmm. things that would make it easier for us to eliminate uh, some of the difficulties between us mm -hmm. by explaining that our country was made up of people from every corner of the world mm -hmm. and that uh, public opinion uh, could have an, an impact on what I could do in the line of 
of compromise with him mm -hmm. because of people in our country who still had an interest. Well, as I explained it to him once, I said, I told him, I said, you, you don't stop loving your mother because you've taken a wife. And I said, the people in our country, everyone has not only the feeling of being an American, but, but it's they, the feeling of their heritage and the many right. people have come yes. from the Soviet Union. And, uh, when, and then when they hear things that they think that people there, and, and in many instances it could be uh, relatives uh, that are being ill-treated. Uh, you speak of, of love of mother, the question of love of God as well. Since becoming General Secretary, Gorbachev has mentioned God a number of occasions. Do you believe that he and Mrs. Gorbachev believe in God and that it affects their public or private lives? I had that curiosity uh, for a time because I was so surprised in the, the use of, of the name a few times and, and, uh, and I couldn't figure how, how I could really get into a one-on-one -on -one conversation on them knowing uh, where atheism stands in their country. Yes. You know, you cannot even be a member of the Communist Party unless you are an atheist. And did you ask him about and, his uh, belief? But I never had an opportunity. I kept thinking if I could only catch him with just my interpreter mm -hmm. around. Uh, but I never did. And then uh, I think I was correctly informed by a Russian expert who, uh, I don't know how the conversation came up, but he told me that no, that was commonplace and it was God with a small g. This is their, their expressions. It was, it was, yes, it mm -hmm. was just a form of expression. Will you, do you believe that in order to be an ethical person, an ethical man, a person has to believe in God? I've never given a thought to that. Uh, I don't know how, some, how people who don't believe set their rules of conduct. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure there are people who are atheists who uh, at the same time uh, abide by the general rules of mm -hmm. conduct that we, we all believe in. I'm just but, wondering uh, if it would make his moral makeup more suspect to bring it into the question if in fact uh, Gorbachev didn't believe in God. Well, uh, the thing is I think that their society uh, can do things to uh, human beings that could not be done uh, without that. But you also have to look at this thing that in spite of them officially being an atheist nation, mm -hmm. the new changes there are that... just millions and millions mm -hmm. of people who believe in God. Yes. Who were raised that way and they do still allow the one church, the Orthodox Church, mm -hmm. uh, to practice and uh, it's religion. You're known as a superb storyteller. What, please share your best story from your trip to the Soviet Union. That'll really help this article to get a sense, give it your best pearl that you dropped or, or, or a story that <laughs> Well, you, I don't know, I mean, are you talking joke or incident? A joke or, or incident, <coughs> incident. <coughs> well, well, there are two ways to answer that. Let me answer in both ways. Uh, one way on, a, on the joke. I have developed a kind of hobby of finding out uh, stories, jokes that I can actually establish are told among the people of the Soviet Union. Yes. And uh, it shows they have a great sense of humor and sometimes there's a little cynicism about <laughs> things just as there is, I suppose, in any society. But uh, one day, uh, here in our Washington meeting, I decided to tell him, having to go through an interpreter, of course, one of those jokes. And this joke uh, uh, happened to be that the story was that an order had gone out in the Soviet Union that, to the motorcycle police that anyone caught speeding was to get a ticket no matter who they were. Well, you know the bulk of the cars are being driven by the, what they call their nomenclatura, the government officials yes. and all, and their drivers. And the story is that Gorbachev came out of his dacha and he was late getting to the Kremlin and the, uh, his driver was there and he told his driver to get in the back seat and he'd drive. And down the road he went and passed two motorcycle policemen. One of them took out after him. And then a few minutes he's back with his buddy. And the buddy says, did you give him a ticket? And he said, no. Well, he said, why not? 
Oh, he said, no, no. He said, well, we were told to give anyone a ticket. And he said, well, no, he, this one was too important. I, well, who was it? He said, I couldn't recognize him, but his driver was Gorbachev. <laughs> and I got a great, he, he appreciated it. It was a great laugh. He thought it was very funny. From this summit, an, an, an anecdote or incident, <clears throat> something you really think back on as, as a uh, moment when you now have thought back on the summit. Well, you know, I tell you, more an anecdote, not, not a story, would be the first time in Geneva. Yes. Uh, here I am, brand new, and so was he. And, uh, you know, I'd sat here through three Russian leaders, all of whom mm -hmm. died, and so there, there was never anything like a summit mm -hmm. or any opportunity for such a thing. Our people had told me that the summit would be a success if we got no more than th the agreement for a, a follow-up summit, another summit. Mm -hmm. Well, I made up my mind something I was going to do, and I told our people about it. And that was when we finally sat down across the table from each other, he and his team and me and mine, as the meeting started, and it started on arms reduction, arms mm -hmm. control. I addressed him and said, look, uh, why don't you and I step out for a little bit and get some fresh air? Let them talk about this, and we'll come back and rejoin them. Well, he was out of the, his chair before I'd even finished the sentence. And we took off, and I had arranged, there was a, it, this was in Switzerland, as I say, and was near the lake, and down by the lake there was a bathhouse belonged to this estate yes. that we were using. And so I had beforehand had a, seen that a fire was going in the fireplace down there, and so we strolled down, and I said, why don't we go in and sit down? And we did, and sat in front of the fire. We talked for an hour and a half. And of course, we were accompanied by interpreters, and, but just that's all that was there, he and I and the interpreters. And we talked for an hour and a half and finally figured we better go back and rejoin mm -hmm. our group. Well, the minute we started, now we discussed a lot of things mm -hmm. that they were probably discussing also. I said things to him like the line I've used so many times since that uh, we don't distrust each other because we're armed. We're armed because we distrust each other. <coughs> and uh, that it was a very unique situation that he and I, uh, in a room together, uh, perhaps could hold the fate of peace or war in the world in, mm -hmm. our, in our hands. Is that one of the moments years from now you look back, say you're in Bel Air, and you'll look back and say that was the moment that summed up the Gorbachev-Reagan relationship? Is there a moment like that where you look back even now? I think, I think that a chemistry had started. Because then, when we left there and started walking up and accompanied by his security and ours and all, why then the conversation was just what it would be about the place and so forth and mm -hmm. talking things. And I don't know what it was, he said something about our country just as we got to where the cars were parked before we went into the, to the building where the meeting was going on. And it prompted me to stop him and I said to him, you have never seen our country. Let me invite you now. Let us agree that the next summit will be held in the United States. And he said, agreed. And then he said to me, and since you've never been to Russia, he said, the following year, we'll have the summit in Russia. And I said, agreed. We shook hands on it and we went in. Well, when the meeting was over inside and I told our people, that we had already arranged two more summits uh, for the next Terrific. two years. <laughs> they couldn't believe it. <laughs> well, now you've gone to the Soviet Union. As you were driving to Gorbachev's dacha, yeah. you had opportunity, dusk was setting, you looked out the windows. What, you've always wanted to take Gorbachev and show him on a plane ride over the States. As you're driving, this is your first chance to see the Soviet countryside. What impressions did you have? Well, what was, went through your mind as you're looking out the window? Well. It was beautiful, but before we got to that open country, there was a thing that had impressed all of us, and I must say to this day is just warms my heart. The Russian people, they lined the streets by the thousands whenever we were going any place in the motorcade. And I mean, when it was just us. Mm -hmm. And their warmth of their greetings, it was, mm -hmm. uh, you couldn't have asked for anything better, the waving and, and <laughs> Your arm could get weary, and finally I rolled the window down a little 
so that I could get my hand out and wait out in the open. Well, that even increased their enthusiasm. But now on this ride, uh, when we left the town, left that, now I was interested in the countryside. What did you see? And it was beautiful. It, the uh, Moscow, uh, at least in, around in that part of it, maybe generally, I don't know, f is uh, surrounded by a, a beautiful birch forest and deep woods. And so you were going through a beautiful countryside and woods and then finally came to uh, uh, where their dacha was. And, and there'd been in the distance, you could see one or two uh, more in the, in the area, but it was it was just beautiful. Tell, tell me about the dacha. What was it like when you? I sure I assume he gave you a little tour. What did what did the dacha seem like? Well, to you? it was. Uh, they're still they're still doing some work there. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, it would be a, a, a fine home here in our own country. It was not a palace or anything, but it was a, a lot of land. Nice. Uh, well, it was hard to tell because it's in the forest there, and. Uh, any little items that uh, you, the, saw, you noticed in the dacha? Well, it was a it, it was brick, but it was in kind of their style, and uh, of, of the Soviet style of of houses. Uh, it was attractive, very comfortable. Owned by him or owned by the state? That's, I never found out. I don't know whether that's his or whether uh, mm -hmm. that's one that is owned in the sign. Any items laying around, things that caught your eye that you thought were fascinating? Uh, well, one thing was a. <laughs> wasn't anything like just seeing an object or anything, but added to the house had been a wing that your first reaction was it's a greenhouse. Well, actually, it was just it was as high as this were the walls and they were glass, but the ceiling was very solid construction and well mm -hmm. done and so forth. So when you got in, it was, it was in a sense, you could say a greenhouse, but it was it was a kind of a winter garden. And mm -hmm. then there were beds in there, set in the floor where there were various kinds of flowers and things growing. It was very attractive, and and we went in and saw that. And, People and in glass houses, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, with their long winters, they, they probably have to. If they're going to have flowers during the year. They're going to have to have something like this. But it was uh, no, it was an attractive and a home-like mm -hmm. place. The Soviets chided you for sermonizing on human rights. In fact, by the end of your visit, Gorbachev was clearly exasperated. You didn't really care about the reaction of the, your hosts, did you? I mean, you really wanted to reach out and stir up the Russian people. Well, I wanted also, no, I didn't want to set him off and uh, set back uh, any gains that we might have made. And, and I questioned this thing about, uh, I saw no exasperation whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, and wasn't, the, wasn't Gorbachev a bit out of line, though, lecturing you for lecturing him? I mean, this is a guy who routinely lapses into uh, sermons well, when talking to Westerners. Well, but lately that has not been true because I've made him understand that, frankly, uh, it wasn't a case of bargaining and saying, well, you change this with the way you treat your people and we'll do this. Not that at all. I made it as a, with his glasnost and I've read his perestroika. Mm -hmm. And I, and I told him, I said, look, I'm, I'm making a suggestion to you that I think would be helpful yeah. on this. And then I told him about some things like, for example, the, the immigration problem. And so much of it, for example, one religion as we know, the Hebrew religion and how many of them want to leave. And I simply made the suggestion that, did he ever stop to think that maybe they're See, Russian too, that they wouldn't, they might not want to leave. Uh, if they were allowed to practice their religion. Does he ever give you an answer as to why people don't have the freedom to leave or freedom to travel? Well, uh, <coughs> no, because right now that has loosened up considerably. Yes, it has. We have made gains there. I understand that last year some 86,000, 8,600 mm -hmm. uh, 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 Jews were allowed to emigrate. Mm -hmm. Well, that is a big step from sure. what had been taking place in the first few years before he was in office here. Let me, ask you, let me ask you, when the Soviets began their recent withdrawal from Afghanistan, a Soviet general declared, quote, the withdrawal is not a defeat. He called it, quote, the fulfillment of the Geneva Accords. Many Americans consider this hot air. Wouldn't you agree that the Afghan pullout is, in fact, a defeat for the Soviet Union? I think the best thing for me to simply state is that uh, it was the proper thing to do. Uh, this administration 
his administration had nothing to do. They'd been in there nine years. So that had done it. Whatever was wrong with, and it was wrong for them to, to try to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think he was uh, using common, good common sense mm -hmm. in getting out of a bad situation. Well, let me ask you this. There's new unrest in Poland. Armenian demonstrators uh, in the Soviet Union, protests in Moscow, a defeat in Afghanistan or a pull out of Afghanistan. Don't these developments give you some twinge of a secret satisfaction that things are... What it makes uh, me feel that, uh, that uh, the people are showing their support for uh, the, the Glasnost proposal. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's evident in their conduct there. Mm -hmm. And we, we have to recognize that he does not have a, a completely free hand that there mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. people in his government that don't want to change. Mm -hmm. And uh, what it appears to me is that uh, he has the people on his side, mm -hmm. if, even though he does not have the nomenclatura and mm -hmm. some of the government. Well, let's say, he, he, some people say Gorbachev will not last. Could a subsequent Soviet leader, if he came to power soon, still reverse his reforms, or is the Glasnost genie out of the bottle now? I don't know, but anyone that tried to reverse course, I think, would have to be either foolish or extremely careful. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, I think he's had some practical, good uh, ideas there that he is, uh, mm -hmm. he's trying to get. And he has something more than just uh, whether the people are happy with it or not. He inherited a terrible economic mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. And that economic problem has been brought on by their vast military buildup. Mm -hmm. So this is another reason why with him uh, uh, there's, there's practicality in uh, trying to come to agreements on reduction of arms. And uh, he's, you realize that he is the first leader of the Soviet Union or during his time, it is the first time that the Soviets have ever agreed to destroy a weapon they already have. Mm -hmm. they're, all their other arms control things were, well, how many more will we build? Or we'll set a limit on how fast we build and so forth. This is the first time mm -hmm. someone has said, no, we'll just, we'll wipe out some weapons. Mm -hmm. In 1986, there was a flap over spying at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. You stayed this time at the ambassador's residence during the summit. What precautions were taken to deter your Soviet hosts from eavesdropping? Well, <laughs> uh, we were, I think, what it is routine uh, with visitors like ourselves uh, there that uh, you are to assume that you can be heard wherever you are. Uh, or that if you're in a, a taxi cab, the driver, a, one of their cars, the driver is, uh, knows your language as well as his own and so forth. So uh, you Anything just- Anything special you did? Uh, you just automatically uh, watch your conversation. Let me ask you this. Let's look back for a moment. On the table at Reykjavik was a plan you put forth. It called for the eventual elimination of all ballistic missiles. But because of a dispute over SDI, you stalked out of the meeting. Some say that moment will go down as one of history's great lost opportunities. Mr. President, Congress is wary of funding SDI, and there's no assurance that a Republican will sit in this office uh, next. Did you, do you ever, ever look back and regret that moment you walked out of Reykjavik? Not at all. Not at all. What we had talked about was a thing, and we had been coming to agreements there aiming at uh, weapons, including conventional weapons and the reduction of all of these down there. And never had there been any, we, we were apparently in agreement. Mm -hmm. And there had never been any argument. And suddenly, when it seems that we're agreed that we should turn our people loose to start by stages, that we were agreed that all of these various weapons should be eventually eliminated, then he threw the curve and said to me, uh, uh, yeah, all this can happen if we stop SDI. Well. Couldn't the two of you have sweated it out some more uh, that night? No, we were hours late then for breaking up the, 
the meetings were all supposed to be over. And uh, uh, there, was, there was just nothing. There was no further conversation unless uh, mm -hmm. a flat agreement then in advance right. that I would quit SDI. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said there was no way that I, SDI was not a bargaining chip, and it isn't. Mm -hmm. I believe my ultimate dream and goal would be the total elimination of nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. Now, I see SDI as the best way to achieve that. The, the, the whole thing came into being when I, early on in my first term, called a meeting of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And with all of this build up and the, the MAD policy, mutual assured destruction, we're supposed to feel safe and sleep nice at night because we know that we can both blow each other up. And that's supposed to be the detente that will keep us yeah. from doing something. I asked the General Chiefs of Staff if they believed it was possible, today's technological world, that no weapon that's ever been invented by man uh, has ever not been followed by defensive weapons against it. Mm -hmm. And I said, isn't it possible that there is a weapon that could, beginning with where those missiles start out of their silos that we could defend against nuclear missiles. Mm -hmm. And uh, they told me they'd like to talk about that and think about that. They thought it was worth thinking about. And they went away and I came in here and a few days later they called and asked for a meeting. They came over and we met and they said yes, they think it's possible. Mm -hmm. Well, I said, then let's let's start the research. Mm -hmm. Well, the rest is history. And before before I go on is. to now the we've photo. had enough breakthroughs. Break well, I just want to go through these photos. That's a, this, very, uh, this. Two minute, uh, All right, these are the. We, I just want to ask two questions, and we'll go through. We're gonna, we really have to go to another meeting. Then. All right. What's the first thing you did when you got home, and the door of the family quarters closed behind you? When you got home from this summit. Oh. And the door of the family. You're you're finally back from Moscow. <laughs> well, we'd had an overnight in England before. I stopped there in a little different climate. Well, no, it was just good to be home and uh, all of a sudden to look at each other and say we can talk out loud now about anything we want. <laughs> <laughs> what do? And, uh, and that, was it. that was it. Let me show you a few photographs. Um, here you are in the car. If you can mm. describe your emotions as you go through uh, looking at the the crowds there? Well, there's just a few here, but here, here because I must tell you that usually, and perhaps back here uh, from where we'd gone and, and down ahead, we're really jammed three and four deep at mm -hmm. the curb. But uh, this was what we... Got a good photographer, I think. This Pete, is, Pete, did you take this one? Yeah. Good thing. Very but nice. this was what we did, and, uh, and they were all enthusiastic in their, in their waving back. And this was the window that finally, I got so tired of <laughs> trying to do this, that I, I lowered this window a little bit and then put that the arm the off the there. window. Yeah. Well, when they could see a hand mm -hmm. actually out the window even before the car got there, they just increased their enthusiasm. Senator Baker is handing you the INF Treaty here. What was your emotion at this point? You finally got the, the INF Treaty in, well, your, in your hands. Well, yes, the, the fact that I was going to be able to present uh, the uh, the articles that that they had to, to implement it when I when we came came there he did not have it with him but it was going to be brought by uh, the two Senate leaders. So what is he came. showing you there? Well, he was showing me here the uh, the articles of the treaty. Yeah. What was your reaction? Did you celebrate that night? Did you? Uh... Well, <laughs> didn't wait till that night. I just felt very happy and relieved. That, you do anything uh, special? No, because this is in Air Force One on the way. If you remember, the president made a phone call the night he learned it had been passed and talked to two leaders. That's, that's the celebration. That's right. I've seen the, the, other, yeah. the pictures on the other end. Yeah. What's going on here? Is this a cake, uh, a dessert? Uh, We're sampling no, a, a it's, it's a, it wasn't a cake. It was a... Souffle? Well, yeah, a whole kind of thing like, like that. And uh, it was so beautiful. 
that you, I kind of had to inquire, do you uh, break into the side of it or do you just <laughs> scoop out the top? Uh, scoop out the top or not. And uh, I think I ended it up that uh, you also took some of the side. Some of the side, where yes. was this? Uh, this is it's the reciprocal dinner. The yeah. reciprocal dinner. Yeah. Yes. Did it taste good? Mm -hmm. Yes, delicious. Now, what do you do? Who is it? I think it looks like you're pointing at Sam Donaldson here. <laughs> what is the circumstance for this? Actually, this was taken in the White House here. Before your trip? And no, this is on a press conference. Yeah. And always before, when they're all assembled in there, and before I'm introduced and going in, uh, I I look and try to find where some people are that. Uh, and where they're seated and located, and uh, so I was identifying someone where the, where the, that I was supposed to call on first. Sam Donaldson. No. 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 That's not, oh, I thought it was. I think that's probably Helen. Uh, Helen Thomas. Thomas. This is. Do you know what happened here? We, we see the first lady laughing with uh, Gorbachev. And I don't know what that's about. I wish I could give you. Is there no, any? But he's a very genial fellow. He really is, and yeah. enjoys a humor and a joke and so forth. That's as I say, good. even. What is this celebration here? We are you're ah, toasting. Well, and here you a, did a little jig. At well, this point. A, kind of a little. Uh, we have a kind of a little um, uh, tradition on Air Force One that if uh, one of the members of our crew has a birthday, uh, we surprise him with a cake and, and the toast and all. Who's cake was this? Yeah. Jim McKinney. Jim, Jim McKinney. McKinney. Yeah. Yeah. Just, it was his. And so there he was. He'd already made the first cuts in the in the cake. And uh, that's great. We'd add something there too, Mr. President. But also, as sort of an added touch, is when a toast was given to the President of the United States and Mrs. Reagan for a successful summit at this at the very Oh, summit. so you had a you uh, also had a toast for a successful Jesus summit? Yes. Yeah. This is prior to arriving. Yeah, oh yes. This is out over the Atlantic someplace. And Mrs. Reagan gave you a toast for a successful song? Mm. The Chief of Staff did Chief of the President yeah. and the First Lady for yeah. a successful Oh, that's yeah. terrific. We're doing the Air Force One story. Peter's been uh, in here. It's going to be a nice story in the fall. I, I hear that uh, this is a shot where you had lipstick on your cheek? I had, uh, I had just finished kissing her uh, <laughs> uh, hello, and uh, you know, sometimes we were separated and such as like when she went to Leningrad for a day and, uh, and so she's I, brushing uh, off the and she's the getting rid of the lipstick that I got from her and where was this that's just prior to the press conference yeah. in Spasa. okay <coughs> this is a terrific photograph all four of you arm in arm whose idea was to put your arm did it just naturally happen where you all got your arms around each other it just really naturally happened. We'd been in inside and, and meeting before, and uh, we all knew that the photographers were all waiting down below and the, and the press, and so we were going to be four abreast, and so we it's linked nice on and started. You look very down. serious here. You're, you're at the Writers' Union uh, with the American Soviet flags on your lapel. What's well, going through your mind there? Well, this is, this is an interpreter behind me. Mm -hmm. And so this is someone who's speaking up here, and I'm just the, the 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 podium from which they spoke was very close to where I was is seated that a moving afternoon? at a table. Yes, it it was, and uh, uh, I'm just hearing their stories. Now you're looking up at a chandelier. What is this? A ceiling? I think that this was. In the Kremlin there, yeah. and the the magnificence of those buildings, and to look up because even well, I remember a couple of times saying, you know, with all our cleverness at skyscrapers and things of that kind, when you looked at these buildings and looked at the art, and the structure, and everything, you found yourself saying, "Could we find anyone today that could do this?" and uh, so I think it was just there was there was magnificent artwork up there and paintings and all. This is at the outside the dacha. What was the feeling uh, as you left? Uh, well, we'd had a very nice time, very pleasant time, and we. Uh, Any story he told you while you're there that stick, comes to mind that sticks in your mind at the dacha? No, because we weren't just the four of us, you know. There it was a it was a. a, a uh, a, a group, a number of people, his people and ours, these foreign ministers, his wife and George uh, Schultz and mm -hmm. things when and you others. think back to the Dutch that come and to mind. Uh, I can't remember anything specifically. Uh, you don't want to take, didn't want to take any silverware or a memento. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. 
All right. What is this here? You're looking at a piece of paper uh, right here. Oh, yes. And now where, where was this? It, um, that's that's uh, in Fossil House. Yeah, that's there. I assume you spent some quiet moments in uh, Spasso House uh, to relax. Yeah, and um, also I can tell you just by the shape of that paper what that was. Um, the uh, our people kept us informed with the with the uh, intelligence. N no, the news clips that, that came, and uh, just as we every morning I get a news summary of what the previous or what the morning's papers and what the previous night's TV and so forth had said. So We'd is this in the them. morning? Uh, As you're getting up? No, this could have been, uh, it could have been, or it could have been later in the day. Uh, because they would come at different times there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'd try to catch up with the news. What's your reaction? There was a la quote in the paper the other day that uh, you've praised Gorbachev more in, in four days than you did George Bush in all those years. Do you have any reaction to that quote? Yes, I do, and so, and he had one too, that it was very unfair. This whole thing that I was cool in my introduction, or, or you see, for a long time I had to remain neutral because I'm the titular head of the party, and as long as there was a contest, primary contest, and it wasn't until George was finally uh, out there alone mm -hmm. that I could then uh, declare, mm -hmm. and so I did it at that big president's dinner here in town. Sure. Well, I wrote myself what I was going to say at the end of my speech about it. That was going to be the first time that I now came out and publicly uh, proclaimed. And uh, I showed it to him, and he was very happy with it. In fact, kept the original piece of paper that I'd Did written it on. Will, will and then for them to say afterward, I was very embarrassed, and I think he was too, when somebody started saying that I was very cool and in a different uh, uh, feel that way at all, nor did I. Will, will there be a fifth summit, or will you have to wait until you're in Bel Air for the Gorbachev <laughs> to visit you? I, I don't know. The, uh, we, I won't allow us to set a deadline on the START Treaty that we're still negotiating on, because uh, that way you can come up with bad treaties. You can say, oh, we've got to have something by this date. No. I would like to hope that in these months ahead we could finalize the start, start treaty, and then I would think that it would be wonderful to have a, a summit and, and a joint signing. Where but, will you uh, show, what will you show him in America if he comes this time? I'd like to show him our ranch, but I'd also like to show him some of them. He hasn't seen America. And I'd like, to, I'd like to show him, uh, I don't know, he might be interested in that, but I'd also like to show him some things that I'm, I'm quite sure from the propaganda he's heard all his life that he can't believe of. In the helicopter, I look down, if you're going over a housing tract and see those lovely little homes and lawns and so forth, and be able to say to him, those are where our working people live. And you'll notice there's a car in the driveway. And uh, because you know, as I say, I understand that uh, less than one family out of seven in the Soviet Union has an automobile. But to see that these people, or an industrial section with the large parking areas and the hundreds of automobiles and say the workers in those factories drive those cars to work. And Maybe like it'll that. be some friendly persuasion. And then, it, But the thing is also with that comes a kind of frustration that would he think that it was a Potemkin village erected just to show him that. That's right, the propaganda, yeah. he may think. Of. I wanted to give you this. This is a gift from life, a book, The Great American Magazine, oh. uh, History of Life. Well, thank you very much. And I, never, I didn't know if I would be here today, Mr. President. My wife had twins this weekend. Hey. So. Well, congratulations. Thank you. So that's Boys, girls, or one, one of each? One of each. One of each. At the jackpot. Sam and Molly. Oh, that's wonderful. So they're the, well, the kids. Congratulations, and please give her my up. best regards. I will, and thank you very much for your time and uh, for responding to the written questions well, as well. I appreciate it.